This is not just a documentary. This is not just a travel program. One probably wouldn't describe this program as pure journalism. Fortunately, it does, however, have all those elements to some degree, plus one more, truth. Not the kind of truth that one is talking about when one gets on the witness stand in court and says, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That statement is a lie from the beginning because that goal is unattainable. And journalism? There are some good journalists, but even they will tell you that the editors decide how much of the truth the public gets to hear and how it might reflect on the corporate advertisers. And that is because most of the press here is controlled by the government or at least influenced by the government. They receive uh, uh, subsidies, money. This program is aiming at the truth that is experienced and perceived by those who live it and by those who suffer and die as a consequence of it and the truth as experienced by myself. So I'll call it art. And who am I? I'm just the driver of an ancient red Volkswagen bus that came to be known as the Relampago Rojo. That's the red lightning to English only speakers. January 1st, 1994, NAFTA goes into effect and what's this? Who are they? Why are they rebelling? And what does it have to do with NAFTA? These questions persisted in my mind and in about March of 1994, the television show 60 Minutes broadcast a brief segment dealing with the Mayan Indian rebels or Zapatistas. A poor Indian farmer or campesino from Chiapas, Mexico, scene of the rebellion, was interviewed. He was asked, how often do you have meat to eat? Never. How about fish? Almost never. Well, we do have a small piece of fish about every other month. And then another person who was in the room with me joked, he should be happy. Meat's not good for you anyway. We had just finished a huge meal that, by the way, had included meat, and our stomachs were full. Immediately after leaving that house, my daughter and I stopped at a Safeway for, what else? More food. We walked through the acres of culinary excess. The baking department beckoned with gleaming counters. The meat department was mesmerizing with its little sanitized and plastic wrapped products. The aisles bulged. In the coffee section, I reached for a can of Taster's Choice, which was selling for $1.23 an ounce, or $19.68 a pound, or $43.29 a kilo, and I wondered how much that campesino in Mexico got paid for his coffee, and then it hit me. Sometimes a series of incidents combined to have a far greater impact than they would have had separately, and I knew then, in that aisle at Safeway, that I was going to try to find out what the connection was between these three things. The material success that many of us take for granted in the U.S., the extreme poverty of the indigenous and the campesino in Mexico, and the callousness and indifference shown by those who have so much and who set the policies. I had questions. O.J. Simpson's defense lost another one today. The jury was allowed to see outtakes of a workout video. A video that doesn't help much. It struck me as no surprise when I remembered that Channel 4 is the affiliate of NBC, which is owned by GE, General Electric. General Electric has 260 plants in 25 countries, 44% of them outside the U.S. 1994 profits, $6 billion. General Electric and its firing of union organizers in Juarez, Mexico, is a subject of at least two cases brought before the National Administrative Offices. When some GE shareholders asked GE to initiate a review of wages and benefits in its Juarez Maquilas, GE vetoed the request. GE is also an arms manufacturer. And O.J. Simpson's friend Al Kellings is back in the news tonight 
Perhaps we'll have better luck with another channel. Let's try Channel 7, the CBS affiliate. CBS is owned by Westinghouse. Does Westinghouse have a NAFTA connection? You bet. 902 plants in 33 countries. Westinghouse is a party to over 4,500 lawsuits, including charges of wrongful death, negligence on nuclear power plants, bribery, contamination of the environment, and many other charges in dozens of jurisdictions. Westinghouse's own shareholders have sued the corporation for misrepresentation regarding the adequacy of internal controls at the corporation. Westinghouse is also an arms manufacturer. General Electric and Westinghouse are in the unique positions of being able to profit immensely from international trade, influence the formulation of trade policy, control the news regarding foreign policy and foreign trade, and make huge profits on the sale of weapons if people rebel against those policies and practices. Let's take a quick look in the newspapers. This is typical. The Zapatista National Liberation Army shocked the nation with an uprising on New Year's Day. More than 145 people were killed in guerrilla fighting with the army before a January 12th ceasefire. The Zapatistas launched a 12-day rebellion to press for better living conditions. 145 were killed in fighting with government troops. Clifford D. May, Associate Editor. Disaffected rebel groups will protest election results with a firestorm of violence and those flames will rage out of control. One might get the impression that disaffected rebel guerrillas killed 145 people because of their poor living conditions and are about to kill more. These articles don't give any answers and they certainly don't talk much about the connection to NAFTA. Clifford D. May again. Which is more important? that a poor country adopt a democratic political system or establish a market economy. I'm convinced the market economy is more vital. Market economies are more likely to produce prosperity and prosperous countries have tended to democratize. Poor countries that only democratize have a poor track record of emerging from poverty and seldom remain democratized. So, Clifford, it sounds like you're saying that we can handle democracy better than they can. This sounds like a modern version of the manifest destiny policy we used last century to justify robbery and genocide against the American Indian. Gee, Clifford, maybe we should send GE down to Chiapas to get the Indians ready for democracy. Since I happen to be going down there, I'll ask them what they think about that. In June of 1994, I flew to Mexico, and again in October, with my friend Bill Murray, not the actor. In Chiapas, I kept hearing over and over in the interviews I conducted testimony about Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, which dealt with land reform for the campesinos and Indians in Mexico, and how President Salinas de Gortari had sacked Article 27 at the request of the U.S. government, multinational corporations, and rich international investors. In 1917 came a constitution, which is the current constitution plus modifications that is in effect now in Mexico. In this constitution, there were the basis for which a land reform was to be established to restore the ownership of, uh, of the land to the indigenous in the form of ejido land. That was land that was owned communally by people, by the groups, by the indigenous groups, and that which could not, would be the patrimony, which would be the, uh, uh, the basic assets of these groups that uh, uh, they therefore would not be able to be sold. Since NAFTA came into effect, and for the purposes of NAFTA, uh, the current president of Mexico changed the constitution to make it attractive for investors who will come then to Mexico and buy this land and establish their own agricultural um, uh, uh, procedures according to, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, agribusiness, I guess it's what it's called, you know, and, uh, and in for which th there was no way in which the indigenous people, um, given the conditions in which they are, could, uh, could stand buyers. 
pues nuestros pueblos lo que queremos, nosotros como, sin, como indígenas, que se nos respete nuestra dignidad, nuestras autonomías como comunidades, que se nos respete también el derecho a la vida, de tener un pedazo de tierra. Nuestras tierras anteriores, antes de la llegada de los españoles, no había propiedades, era una sola propiedad comunal y así lo seguimos sosteniendo y seguiremos luchando por ella por tener una propiedad comunal para el futuro de nuestros hijos y nuestros nietos y las futuras generaciones que puedan venir más adelante sobre el artículo 27 reformado es una consecuencia del tratado de libre comercio porque eso abre las puertas a diferentes países poderosos para venir a invertir en nuestro país y para invertir en nuestro país también quieren asegurar que ese dinero sea garantizado nosotros, al escuchar en la reforma del artículo 27, estamos viendo de que es nuestras tierras que pasarían a, ser, eh, pasarían a ser poder de las compañías extranjeras, de, las, de los inversionistas grandes que invertirían en nuestra tierra. Se hizo una repartición de tierras para que el indígena tuviera una parcela siquiera para poder comer eh, o mantener a su familia. Que el, por falta de educación y de medios y de, de ayuda eh, gubernamental es mucha. Cada indígena, aunque se les mueren de hambre o de enfermedades, eh, hay, cada indígena lo menos tiene cinco, seis, siete hijos. Entonces... Eh, el pedacito de tierra eh, a la primera enfermedad de un hijo o de su esposa eh, lo venden por una irrisoria cantidad, digamos, les pagan lo que quieran los grandes terratenientes que eh, existen todavía en esta parte de México. Entonces el indígena ya no tiene tierra, ni siquiera eh, para vender. El miedo de ellos es que los patronos de ahora, los terratenientes de ahora, sean los que vendan a las grandes eh, compañías norteamericanas esa tierra del artículo 27. This change to the Mexican Constitution would end up taking the permanent land holdings from the Indians and placing them in the hands of multinational corporations. What makes this particularly upsetting to the poor in Mexico is that 20% of the people in Mexico had died fighting in a revolution only 80 years ago to guarantee these land reforms, one of them being the revolutionary hero Emiliano Zapata, who was largely responsible for including land reform in the Mexican Constitution. Ahora, lo único que faltaba era que los campesinos tuvieran los medios necesarios económicos para poder trabajar la tierra como se debe, pero con esta reforma al artículo 27, en vez de ayudar a los campesinos, viene a matar los ideales que Zapata levantó, lo borra de un plumazo. In December of 1994, I happened to be talking to U.S. Attorney Henry Solano, who was present at a private residence where I was showing some footage from my June trip to Chiapas. He appeared to be sympathetic to the plight of the people in Mexico, but his attitude reflected a disturbing, somewhat racist attitude that many people in the U.S. share. When I asked him what right we, in the U.S., had to alter the Mexican Constitution and Mexican social policy, he said, that Indian land in Mexico has to be made productive, and if they're not going to make it productive, then it has to be put in the hands of someone who will. He went on to say, the Zapatistas may have a just cause, but they're dead. I decided to ask someone in Mexico what they thought of Henry Solano's attitude as well as the one expressed earlier by Clifford D. May. I felt I needed to continue my trips to Chiapas. I didn't want to be like most journalists who only show up when the bullets are flying and never stay on through the real struggle. Plus, I still wanted to meet the leaders of the Zapatistas. I wanted to drive on this next trip so that I could have my own transportation while there, so that I could have a vehicle to sleep in, and so that I could take more supplies with me than I could take if I flew. 
I needed a vehicle that was common in Mexico in case I needed to make repairs. I needed... Tourist note, if you drive to Mexico, be sure to take a credit card. I drove to Mexico in 1992 and didn't need one, but now that NAFTA passed and the barriers are allegedly coming down, you need to get a temporary permission to drive a Mexico sticker to make sure you don't sell your vehicle. There is a mere $10.40 charge for this if you have a credit card, but for those who don't use credit cards, you have to put up an outrageous amount of money, a large portion of which you never get back, to make sure you don't sell your car. What about free trade, I protested. You could drive in Mexico without getting this sticker, but only for about 30 kilometers until you reach the second government checkpoint. That is far enough, however, to sell a vehicle to one of the employees of General Electric's maquilas or factories in Juarez, as long as they're not a union organizer. It seems union organizers can't get work there, especially at General Electric. Or 30 kilometers is far enough to be able to drive right to one of the General Electric maquilas to apply for a job. Again, assuming one is not a union organizer. But enough of that. The brakes on my car went out back on Raton Pass in Colorado, and I've been waiting until I got to Mexico to buy a used master cylinder. Oops, small problem, but Danielle here, the first mechanic I found in the little village of Villa Ahumada, fixed me right up. ¿Qué piensas, doctor? ¿Vive o es... vive? No. ¿Vivo o es muerto? Vivo. Vivo. Hey. ¿Qué tipo de enfermedad tiene? Mexico City, the largest and most polluted city in the world. People arrive here for many reasons, but most of them arrive for one of two reasons. Some are seduced by the material promise of television, and some are fleeing economic and governmental repression. But regardless of the reasons they arrive here, they will most likely live in a place like this, or this. Or they may continue north to the United States, the land of the free. Traveling south, I passed through Morelos and Puebla, 
and before too long was passing through Oaxaca. As I wound down these hot, dry, mountainous hills, I began to get very despondent. I was thinking back to a conversation I had with Congressperson Pat Schroeder's district director, Kip Chirutas, in July of 94. We talked about Chiapas for a while, and then he said, Kerry, I'm concerned about this situation, and I think the Zapatistas have a valid cause. They had quite a bit of publicity for a while, but it seems to have died down. Did you say there were hydroelectric dams in Chiapas? Yes, Kip. Well, maybe they could blow one up to get everyone's attention again, he suggested. Suppose you live in the north, center, or west part of the country. Suppose you decide to know the southeast of your country, and suppose that from the southeast you choose the state of Chiapas. Suppose you take to the highway. Suppose you don't pay attention to the headquarters that an artillery regiment of the Federal Army has at the height of Matias Romero, and you continue to La Ventosa. Suppose you don't take the warning that the Immigration Service of the Secretary of Government has a checkpoint at that spot. And that makes you think that one leaves a country and enters another. Suppose that you turn left and decidedly head towards Chiapas. Kilometers further down, you leave Oaxaca and you'll find a big sign that says, Welcome to Chiapas. Did you find it? Well, suppose that you did. By thousands of roads, Chiapas bleeds. By oil lines, gas lines, electric lines, by railroad cars, by bank accounts, by buses and trucks, by ships and airplanes, by clandestine roads, dirt roads, potholes, and forest trails, this land continues to pay tributes to the empires. Oil, electric energy, cattle, money, coffee, bananas, honey, corn, cacao, tobacco, sugar, soy, sorghum, cantaloupe, mamey, mango, tamarind, and avocado, and Chapanecan blood flow through the thousands and one fangs of the looting, buried in the throat of the Mexican Southeast. What does the beast leave behind for all that it takes? Education? The worst in the country. In elementary schools, for each 100 children, 72 do not finish first grade. More than half of the schools do not offer more than third grade, and half only have a teacher for all the courses they offer. These are only very high numbers, hidden, certainly, of a scholastic disservice to indigenous children due to the need to incorporate the child into exploitation. You have arrived to the poorest state in the nation. What do you see? You're right. You enter into another world, the indigenous. This indigenous world is populated by 300,000 Seltales, 300,000 Solsiles, 120,000 Choles, 90,000 Soques, and 70,000 Tojolobales. Continue by the highway into the forest. You come into the region called Los Altos de Chiapas. Here, 500 years ago, the Indians were the majority, lords and masters of water and lands. Now, they are only the majority in numbers and poverty. Continue. Arrive at San Cristobal de las Casas. A hundred years ago, it was the capital of the state, but the interbourgeois aggressiveness took away the doubtful honor of being the capital of Mexico's poorest state. No, no, don't stop. If Tuzla Gutierrez is a great warehouse, 
San Cristobal is a great market. By thousands of routes, the indigenous tribute arrives to capitalism. Solciles, Tzatzales, Choles, Tojolobales, and Soques all bring something, wood, coffee, kettle, textiles, pottery, fruit, vegetable, corn. All take something, disease, ignorance, corn, and death. From the poorest state in Mexico, this is the poorest region. Welcome to San Cristobal de las Casas, colonial city, say themselves, but the majority of the population is indigenous. Welcome to the great market that Bromasol embellishes. Here everything is bought and sold, and except indigenous dignity. Here everything is expensive, except death. Unfortunately, Subcomandante Marcos is right about San Cristobal de las Casas being a great market to profit from the misery of the Indian and the Campesino. Typically, either Mexicans of Spanish ancestry called Ladinos or foreigners own everything, from the hotels and travel agencies to the restaurants and the craft stores where Indian crafts are sold to wealthy U.S. and European tourists. A woman in one craft store was boasting to me of her mixture of Spanish and Indian mestizo blood one moment and then calling her Indian assistant a stupid Indio the next. With the recent Indian uprising, however, a different group of people have become more noticeable around town. These are Mexicans and foreigners who have come to aid the disenfranchised peoples of Chiapas rather than to exploit them. They include doctors, teachers, human rights observers, writers, documentary makers, caravans of people bringing aid, indigenous people from other countries and other parts of Mexico, engineers, church groups who come to help instead of to preach, nurses and healthcare practitioners, carpenters, laborers, and the thousands of members from all over Mexico of the Convención Nacional Democrática, or Democratic National Convention, who have been assembling regularly to try to forge just political solutions to the problems. Most of the aid workers and civil observers are coordinated from the Cathedral of Bishop Samuel Ruiz. <laughs> pregunta que estamos eh, anunciados anticipadamente que se nos va a hacer el día del juicio final es de qué manera se dirigió toda nuestra vida en la orientación hacia el pobre y su sufrimiento al grado que es el pobre el sacramento de la presencia de Cristo cuando tuve hambre no me diste de comer o cuando tuve hambre me diste de comer y se extrañarán los que lo hicieron o no lo hicieron con el pobre para saber que Jesús dirá finalmente, siempre que lo hicieron o no lo hicieron con estos pequeños hermanos míos, lo hicieron o no lo hicieron conmigo. In order to maximize the benefits and minimize the potential harm that well-intended but misguided people can cause, one should check in at the cathedral next to the plaza. There is an organization there that is coordinating the resources and the needs, and issuing credentials to distinguish credible volunteers from government spies or saboteurs of the peace process. Of course, this goodwill has not been welcomed by the people who have traditionally had a free reign of exploitation and repression, including the large ranchers and landowners, the rich businessmen, the federal army, the police, the judges. Kita. Buenas tardes. ¿Qué pasa? 
Nada. Nada pasa. No. Uh, ¿Estás uh, esperando para una cosa? No. Ni nada. And the corrupt and dictatorial PRI party who seized power in Mexico 65 years ago. This latter group employs violence, intimidation, and terrorism to try to maintain their grip on power. Um, in un punto de los zapatistas, dicen, quieren no más, um, como se dice, uh, tortura. ¿Por qué, ¿Por qué estás hablando que tortura? ¿No conoces no, nada? No sé. No. Bueno, es que se manejaba que la justicia, la aplicación de la justicia en México es a base de torturas. 